Thank you all for being here today. Um, I found it ironic. Last year I was teaching um, how to sell to restaurants. That's been uh, my specialty over the last four years. I went to culinary school out of um, high school, but I also had this passion for farming, so I found a way to combine the two, and that was working with chefs. And uh, last year when I stood here to teach you, I told you that my next goal was to expand my market. And so um, my goal at that time was to reach Dallas. And so I'm here to tell you today that that happened in the, in the months following. I applied to the Dallas Farmers Market and was accepted, but I was going with a new venture. I was going to sell hot food and ready to eat. As I worked with chefs and restaurants, I just kept thinking, these guys are taking what I raise and they're turning it into their salaries, into paying all these employees, into paying the lease on this building from what I've raised. How can I do that? How can I make that profit? So I knew I needed to move into hot and prepared foods, and my chefs are so incredible. Um, once you connect, make those relationships, whether it's a family or a chef, those bonds are so strong, you just become family once they rely on you for their food source. So uh, my chefs taught me what I needed to do to get to that point, and they've been a, a huge um, reason why I've been successful this year. So this has kind of been my journey. I sell wholesale $3 a pound for pork. I sell it in primal cuts, and um, I try to sell the whole animal. At the farmer's market to families, I would sell pork or chicken for $7 to $12 a pound. It's just me. I don't have staff. So I found it hard to do retail sales. Um, on large scale because going to door to door that takes a lot of time a lot of energy we live on farms we live an hour from town like many of you we're not in the city so I couldn't I wasn't scaling up like I wanted to so um, I just continued to innovate one of um, my clients is Google and when I toured the kitchen they taught me something and I, I think I may have shared this last year, but they have a case for drinks, and they said when they refill the case with the drinks, they have to put the drinks in the same exact place every single day, or it takes their employee too long to make a choice. They have studied us as humans and how we operate, and Google doesn't want their employee at lunch taking too much time to find the Dr. Pepper if it's on a different shelf. And so I take these little nuggets that I learned from these guys, and I'm like, how do I get somebody to buy my chicken, not from the grocery store? I'm asking them to go out of their routine, wear their program, and support me by going online and making a purchase or coming to the farmer's market. And that can be so difficult to break the consumer habit. And Google has made that clear in putting the Dr. Pepper in the same place every single day. At farmer's markets, we sit in here and we talk year after year. Our biggest complaint is that families come in with their dog in one hand, their coffee in the other. I've heard that from the very beginning when I got into production farming. So, <laughs> I mean, it's frustrating. You can't take home all your groceries while you're walking your dog and you're drinking your coffee. My goal is to make money so um, they can walk their dog and eat a hot dog. And that's what I did. That's, I turned a $3 product into $40. Nobody could believe me that I was doing that. And I'm like, I charge $10 a pound, $10 a hot dog, bratwurst. There's four in a package. I'm making $40. All I had to do was heat it up and serve it on a hot dog bun. Now, I went to Sam's, and I'm like, how do I make this a meal deal? They have huge case of water at Sam's for $3. So if you give them, it's summertime, people are hot. So I would try different flavored drinks, not soda, because we are the anti-soda 
league around here, but different flavored sparkling waters, things like that. It's hot. People just want ice cold water. So I didn't battle that. I just went with it. So I have ice chest, ice cold water. It's 13 cents. 13 cents, and you tell them you're going to sell them a, a meal. You can add chips. A lot of people didn't even want the chips. Very few people wanted the chips. They wanted the bratwurst, and they wanted their drink. Okay, so as I go into this, in working with my own local health department in Mays County, I've learned that each of you, <laughs> as we know as farmers, it's up to interpretation. The law is up to interpretation with who you're dealing with. So you is your homework to figure out what your rules are for your county. If you're in a city, you might have twice as many. Tulsa City, Oklahoma City, Owasso. You may have additional reg regulations over the, you know, us working in the counties. So that's your homework on what you want to sell to figure out what you need to abide by. So Home Bakery Act, so simple. We've had classes on that every year to get your foot in the door. You can do that from home. There's a list of items you, you can do. You cannot cook meat products from home. You cannot. So it has to have, let me just put that out there, no matter where you are in the state, you cannot cook meat from home. So I have my butcher make the bratwurst. He smokes them, in my lesson, um, he smokes them at the butcher shop. And so when I get it to the farmer's market, I'm just heat and serve. It was easier, more peace of mind that I'm not cooking something up to temperature, although I have that opportunity to do that in Dallas. I wanted to be sure that I gave somebody something that's already cooked. So I'm heat and serve, and um, my butcher, it's all done. USDA inspected, packaged, and certified for me to do that. I also have a list of commercial kitchens that I'll, I'll put up here at the end across the state. So um, last year we had that compiled, and so you can reach out and work with a commercial kitchen near you to get these items prepared for market day. So my chef, I went to a restaurant supply company who, and worked with a chef who got out of restaurants and he got into equipment sales. So he set me up with this little flat top. It's one burner, two burners. I can carry it in a plastic tote, plug it in to electricity, and I'm telling you, this is a money maker. I put onions on there, you can hear the sizzle, and people will come, they're like, I can smell this from a mile away, what are you cooking? I, I want whatever it is. Those onions and that sound of that, that grill is just entices people because they come hungry. So you'll see later, but I have my brats lined up. I've got onions on there. People can hear it. People can smell it. Um, this is a Cambro. So there's bakers that bring hot foods in there or cold foods in there to keep the market, you know, at temperature for the market day. And then they, trans, you know, sometimes they'll transfer it into display cases and whatnot. But that's another device that you can use to transfer and keep foods hot or cold. And then um, here's another item. So, for example, if you make honey, you should be selling, like, infused teas. Starbucks is a multi-billion dollar company selling tea. You could put tea in there with your flavored honey and sell it for $5 a cup. You, instead of asking someone to buy a whole jar for $5, you're selling them a teaspoon of honey for $5. I'm telling you, they're coming, they're hot, they want something to drink, you give it to them. So here's my experience. I love Michael's talks because I kind of piggyback off of what he has said. I offered pulled pork also. Pulled pork was cheaper. My butcher smoked it, pulled it, packed it. I had retail packages, and I would 
All I had to do was warm it up. So I had a commercial holding steam pan that I bought. I'd bring it up, I put a little crock pot liner in there, I'd bring it up to temperature. It was easy, but 100 to one, they wanted the bratwurst because they could see it. The pulled pork was holding in a steamer out of sight, out of mind. They wouldn't buy it. I dropped it from my menu. It, it was taking me too much energy to sell one or two pulled pork sandwiches to deal with all the equipment, to go through all that, and then I'd take it home, tell my kids to run pulled pork for dinner. And they got tired of eating it <laughs> every Monday, so I pulled it from the menu. Um, when I originally started the Dallas Farmer's Market, I brought all my frozen cuts, all my pork, all my chicken, all my eggs, and I'm telling you, I sold a package of bacon and a dozen eggs and over 100 bratwurst. And I did it a few more weeks, and I was like, I'm done. I'm not selling any more frozen meat. This is what people want. In Dallas, parking's difficult. You gotta walk a long way. People aren't coming out there to grocery shop. There's a lot of, I mean, it's downtown in a major, much the fourth largest city in America. So there's a lot of conferences. People are, it's a tourist destination. It's an iconic tourist destination. So people are coming to just hang out for the day. And I've heard people asking in the previous session with Michael, it's like, how do I draw people to my market? Every, it's privately owned which is huge, and I've been involved with several different farmer's markets here in Oklahoma. Um, they throw a party for everything. We have a lavender festival. We have a peach festival. We have a watermelon festival. We have a corn festival. We have a hatch chili festival. They have a festival for, ev a strawberry festival for everything. They make it a party. We have yoga with pigs. Y'all do goat yoga, we do yoga with pigs. They have the yoga studio bring their people out, charge them rent to have yoga at the farmer's market. I'm telling y'all, throw a party whenever you can to bring the city out. They're gonna come hungry, so come drink your flavored tea that you put your honey in that you just grew. All right, <laughs> this is how I started. I thought I'd just be vulnerable. I did beer soaked brats. I can't sell beer, I don't have a beer license, they won't license the farm, I've already asked. So this is a pancake grill from like Walmart that I already had at home. <laughs> That's how I started. I, people would buy it, I couldn't bake enough of them. But I, I mean, I, I don't have restaurant experience, so I grew. And that um, red and white, Plastic, it's from Hobby Lobby. So I had to learn from the pros as I started, and I did beer-soaked brats because I thought that was a little catchy, and then people really didn't care. And then you have the people who were like, am I gonna get drunk on this? I'm like, no, you're not gonna get drunk on this. I also had a large variety, which bogged me down, because as you're preparing this and keeping this hot and ready, I just whittled it down to two options which ended up being German, which isn't even on there, and jalapeno cheddar. Jalapeno cheddar is my number one seller. You can't make enough of it. But I realized just too many options just cost you time. Joel Salatin at Polyface Farm is really big on time and motion studies, and that just is always resonates with me and making my time worth it. So I study these things. <laughs> this is my like. This is my cousin, um, <clears throat> raggedy tent from Walmart that I already had is barely working, but I rented this hot dog roller from the restaurant supply company while I was trying to figure out how to start. Well, I realized when I rented that, good thing I didn't buy it. Bratwurst are curved, so it wouldn't roll it. <laughs> and I was like. I bought it and it hadn't shipped yet, and so we had to change it out. But it was a learning experience. So this is my holder. I had grilled onions in there. I had from Siggy's, I had their purple cabbage, and I had 
um, regular sauerkraut. But uh, this is so like, <laughs> this is funny. Um, and then there's my beer. So I was trying to like catch people's eye because it's my opening day. There's over 400 vendors at the farmer's market that rotate in and out of the whole year. And I'm tucked away with the farmers. They also have restaurant row. So people, by the time they got to the farmers, weren't hungry. So, but I was still doing well. And then there's my eggs. You can see I'm kind of new. And there's my three compartment sink. I got those tubs at Sam. And we just have to keep, in Dallas, you just have to have bleach. So um, you don't have to have pressurized water. You don't have to have hot water. And then there's my, that little water thing right there. You can get it grocery store and you have five gallon bucket right there that's your hand washing station a little soap right there and then there's my bleach with that blue lid and my freezer back there we have to have all of our product frozen you can't use ice chests or refrigerator and here's my water over here and my buns but this is like one of my very first opening days and then I hung out with the pros and upgraded so it's funny I wanted to, I'm on restaurant row here. I'm the first one on the restaurant row. I got this fancy tent after I sold a ton of bratwurst at the Watermelon Festival. They brought 40,000 people in. So I butchered a couple of hogs and I was ready. They told us to all really ramp up. Dallas Farmer's Market brings in 10,000 people a day on a regular day up to 40,000. So here's my new sign. I wanted them to know this was made by a farmer, and you'll be shocked. You know, I'm always teachable. So these pros that are there, the honey guy, older gentleman, wise, he just invested in me the first couple of days, and he was like, he's a marketer. Like he has to sell his honey. So he was like, in your first sentence, your customer needs to know what you do. Your first sentence, that's all you have. You got three seconds to hook someone, or you're going to lose it. I was like, okay, I had to figure it out. So my opening line, I'm your farmer, I raise my animals, I make my bratwurst. And I wait for a response. And they're like, you're what? I have farmer made on my sign. 99% of people don't realize you're the farmer and you made this. I'm the farmer, I raise my animals, I made my bratwurst. Would you like one? Yeah, and then you tell them you have take-home packages, too, because I also have those to sell. So be sure you always tell your customer, you're the farmer and you did this. That's going to resonate with them. I know when I was at Cherry Street Farmer's Market, along with this, I, 400 vendors at the Dallas Farmer's Market, I am the only farmer and 400-plus people making ready-to-eat foods. I'm the only, I beg my farmer friends, I'm like, y'all, they won't let me sell beef because we have a lot of cattlemen. I'm like, why aren't you making hot hamburgers? Come next to me. There's a farmer first policy. Come next to me and make hamburgers. Well, we're on the front of the line. I'll do hot dogs, you do hamburgers. No, 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 no. I'm like, dude, $40 a pound, easy. You're selling it for six. Come on, get a grill. People are just, they won't get out of their comfort zone. You can see how I started. I didn't know what I was doing. But I learned, and I figured this out. So um, I kind of got food safe. <laughs> these, are, these have covers, little tongs. Um, I got fancy with my little flat top. My freezer's still there. That warmer is still there. It's gone pretty soon after that. But I got this printed with my menu. It's eye level, 30 bucks at FedEx, and it's laminated. So, it, you know, it's, and these weights right here are, oh, they're so, you fill, them up, you fill them up with water, and you empty it out. So they're so light. You don't have to deal with weights. I would use cinder blocks, and that would just annoy me, because you're hot, you're sweaty. And then this comes with sides. I got this on Amazon. And you can, you know, if you're cold, you can put your sides up. The sun's coming in. You can put your sides up. <clears throat> but, and then this, I learned a secret. 
you get that floor length, we're Saturday and Sunday. You can tuck all your stuff away under there. So the weirdos that want to come in there and look around your tent thinks it's empty. So I hide my stuff. We all do. It's downtown, so there's, like, people always walking around. But I had all my condiments. This is before I got food safe, and then I got food safe. Um, but I even whittled this down. This is just too much. Time and motion studies. Too much going on. I cut the red onions. I cut the sauerkraut. You got to figure out what's moving. I learned in Oklahoma, y'all don't like grilled onions. I did a bratwurst thing for my kids' baseball. What is wrong with y'all? I couldn't give those things away. And I had a whole bag from Sam's. They were like, no. I want ketchup or mustard. Why are you cooking onions? Jalapenos, grilled onions, pickles. Y'all, well, Dallas people put pickles on their hot dog. That's weird. So I just trim this down to three, and that's what they get. See? That was at the baseball event. Nobody wanted my onions. But jalapeno cheddar, regular German. Doesn't that look good? Would y'all buy that? I'm all stuffed. I can't even think about eating right now. Okay. Um, ideas. I was at Cherry Street Farmer's Market. Before that, I started at Owasso. I was at Owasso Farmer's Market, and it was in the parking lot of YMCA. Parents are coming out. They're hungry. I mean, you, this could have happened there. They're taking their kids. They're on the run. It's Saturday morning. You could do, and this happens at Cherry Street. You could do breakfast burritos because the restaurant on Cherry Street is doing breakfast burritos, but they're not a farmer. Here's my issue with farmer's markets, and y'all have to be the advocate at your farmer's market. Y'all, I get into agriculture policy, and then I get told to be quiet, but we have a producer standard, and in these Oklahoma markets, they expect everything on your table to be produced by you, right? Can't sell anything you didn't grow. But the guy next to you, the restaurant next to you, they're selling prepared foods that don't have one farm Oklahoma grown ingredient. And the people coming to the farmer's market are coming to a farmer's market to buy from farmers. And the value added people there don't have ingredients from you. I have an issue with that. So I think that as farmers, you'll need to push for those people to buy from you. If you don't want to sell breakfast burritos, they should be buying your eggs. They should be buying your bell peppers. They should be buying your onions. They should be buying all the ingredients that are in season to go in these burritos instead of selling Sam's ingredients right next to you at a farmer's market. So that's my advocating for farmer's market policy. Breakfast burritos, you can do that in the morning at a commercial kitchen. You can wrap them up in foil and you can keep them on a steam table. You don't need electricity, nothing. As long as it's wrapped and contained at the, at the kitchen and brought and kept hot and kept its food safe temperatures, um, that is an easy sell. Easy sell. There's always a line at Dallas for breakfast items, pastries, you could do pulled pork. One, you could have your butcher smoke your pulled pork, package it. You could do samples. So you could just warm it up. You give samples. You can tell if they like it, they're going to smell it because they're going to smell the smoke in it. And then you tell them, you know, hey, I've got this one pound package of pulled pork that you can go home and heat for lunch after you've given them the sample. Um, Bratwurst, elote is a big thing. The money they make on corn and with a little Parmesan cheese and butter on top is ridiculous. When I was interviewing the people at the Dallas Farmer's Market and I was looking around to see what they were selling, I'm like, in my head, thinking about profit margins, and I told the guy who sells corn with a little squirt of butter on it, I'm like, your profit margin is incredible. And he was like, don't count my money. I was like, okay, I'm just saying can't believe you're getting that. And um, 
he does go a step and beyond, but he has a roaster with um, fueled by propane. So he roasts the corn, then he shucks it, and then so it's definitely, um, you know, not just out of the can from Sam's juices, like flavored water. I'm telling. These are things that are selling at the Dallas Farmers Market. We go to these. Fe- we have these festivals, and these. There's one guy with, like, these huge water containers, and it has like fruit in it and water. And he goes through can- so many containers at these festivals, and I'm like, this is water with strawberries in it, and he's killing it. He can't. He keeps going home to get more. I'm like, oh my gosh, if you grow strawberries, all you got to do is flavor your water. It's crazy. Um, um, ham- we talked about hamburgers. Vegan is a huge, huge, huge thing right now. If you're doing produce and vegetables, vegan, put vegan label on anything, and you can charge twice as much. The vegan people at our market sell $20 plates of food. It's incredible. I can't believe that they sell their, pro- their food dishes for 20-something bucks. Put vegan on it. It's, it's a marketing label. Um, the fermented people at Cherry Street Farmers Market, they're not farmers. They're buying from the farmers. They're fermenting the vegetables, you know, and selling it. If you did it yourself, you could be getting those, reaping those profit margins. And um, ice cream is another big thing that we saw at Cherry Street. And Michael talked about that earlier today. And we have at the Dallas Farmer's Market, one tiny scoop of ice cream, man, five bucks. And you get like three bites. Skincare products is big right now. This custom soaps. If you're into goats, I know a lot of people are doing goats. That's a big thing. Infused teas. If you look up that hashtag Dallas Farmers Market, you'll see a lo- it's almost all food. Almost all food. <clears throat> but there's a lot of examples on there, things that you could think about. Um, like, like Michael said earlier, presentation is everything, and I study this. I study, you know, what are the brick-and-mortar people doing in Dallas in the, in the fancy areas? You know, I try to learn from them. This is a cake place that is in a very affluent neighborhood that I didn't even know was there, but a friend of mine from the market took me there to go have a bite to eat. It, it's beautiful when you walk into her store. I mean, just, just the whole thing is eye-catching. And looks high, and it and it is very high end. So you walk into the store, and you have all these varieties of cakes, and you just buy it by the slice. I'm telling you, grab and go items. Think about what your gift is, what you like to do, that somebody could carry, that's bite sized that'll quench their hunger. So this is my neighbor at the farmer's market. She is from England. She's so fun. But here, you can see everything. Going back to the pulled pork and the bratwurst, out of sight, out of mind. So you want to be sure that people can see what you have. She's got a mixture here, these little fancy pastries up top right here, meat pies. She roasts off in her kitchen beef and mushroom it makes pot pie and I'll buy six of them take it home for my kids so she's got a mixture of of meat sweet and savory she sells her cake she always has a cute little cake by the slice people come in here I mean they she is slammed in the morning fish people are slammed this is her pot pies that she does. She'll do chicken and vegetable, um, steak and ale. I forgot what the ale means, but it's really, really good. Um, Okay, so I was supposed to split this time with um, somebody else, but they weren't able to present, so I get y'all for an hour. Um, These are some principles. I study successful 
business people to see what they're doing, how I can learn from them. Oprah Winfrey has a vision board and she's a billionaire. Why does she need a vision board? It is so important. If you don't write down your vision, your goals for the year, what you need on your farm, what you want on your farm, your hopes, your dreams, your desires, maybe it's a certain tractor, maybe it's a cedar, maybe it's fencing, you need to be writing it down. In my bag, at my chair, I have my notebook with my vision board. I'm always writing things down. If you don't write it down, it's not going to happen. And instead of looking through your social media feed at night, you need to be reading and rereading and implanting that into your consciousness every single day to see what your goals are, see what you need to be attaining to. Um, at least 300 items, at least. And in one year, you'll, see, you'll be amazed at yourself how much you've already scratched off. We're six weeks into the year. I've already started to scratch things off. It keeps you focused on what you need to do for the year. Read it morning and night. I'm telling you, millionaires, billionaires, they have, some of them have a picture. It's their, it's their screensaver on their phone, their vision board. Stay focused on what you need. <clears throat> okay. I, we have this land. We could do anything with it. I did. I spread myself way too thin. I, ha I have all these different species of livestock. But you, in, in your heart and mind, you have a vision. You have, an ima you know, your imagination is yours with what you want to do with your farm. It's not mine. It's not going to be your wife's or your husband's. You need to focus on that. That was given to you. You need to develop that within yourself so that you can make the best use of your gifts on your farm instead of trying to be everything to everyone and spreading yourself too thin. So fear of failure, Michael, <laughs> I follow Michael. <laughs> he just posted this a couple days ago. He said, one of a friend of his said, you should fail like 25 times a quarter or something crazy like that. And that resonated with me because I'd read this in a business book about, you know, this is all part of light learning. You know, not everything works, works out. So just because a crop failed or you weren't able to succeed in selling a specific piece of livestock, it's a growing experience. You, you grow from that. I mean, I can tell you countless things that I've tried that haven't worked out. And like Michael said at lunch, like, you know, <laughs> when those spring floods hit, I had four feet of water in my pasture and lost my entire crop, 500 birds, one day before they were going to be butchered. I was so frustrated. It almost took me out last year. I had so much money invested in that. It was tough. Computer, the community rallied. They helped me get myself back on my feet. But these are all experiences that we go through and um, makes us stronger. Don't be afraid to fail. Don't be. It's going to happen. Makes us stronger. OK. What is the single thing that you do your absolute best with the least amount of effort? That's your gift, not your passion. Your passion is an emotion. Focus on what you're gifted at doing and write it down. Does anyone know the story of Marie Callender? She was working at a greasy diner. He was going out of business. She was a single mom. And she was like, hey, can I make a pie? He was like, yeah, OK make a pie. She sold all the pieces. The next day, the customers came in. They were like, hey, where's that pie? It was delicious. So she made two pies and then three. And then she bought the restaurant and turned it into a bakery, put a commercial kitchen in her house. You can't go to any place in America, any grocery store, without seeing a product of hers. And she started off with one pie. One pie. So just like Michael said earlier, what can you make?
for $10. Sell 10 of them. You're at 100. Do that 10 more times. You're at 1,000. That single thing that you sold for $10, continue to multiply that by 10, you're going to hit a million dollars. Easy. This lady did it off one pie at a place that was about to go out of business. So that is <laughs> my passion. So it drives me. Um, I just study, I study uh, business leaders, and, and I try to glean from their wisdom and their stories and implement that um, in my journey. I mean, I, I went, I've, I've done it all, I feel like. Um, it's been the absolute joy to share what we do with, with our community. And um, I couldn't believe CNN found a couple of us in Oklahoma. They, they were from each side of the state to, to document what we do here. Um, we're kind of a flyover state. But they're, and they're going to show the, the broadcast in the um, East Coast and West Coast in the major cities they're not going to show it here in Oklahoma since they said that we already know how to farm, so they're going to try to teach the city people about farming. But um, is there anything, is there any questions? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Anybody could do it. Like, you just have to do it according to the health standards. It has to be USDA-inspected food um, for meat. It has to be USDA-inspected. Yes. Yeah, we couldn't on-farm butcher meat, make ours in a home kitchen, and then sell it. So all meat products have to be done inside a USDA inspected kitchen, not just a commercial kitchen. So, um, yeah, and selling that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. There's a guy that does it in, in Dallas, and he roasts the tomatoes. That's his thing, is he roasts it and gets that smoky flavor in it, and he sells jars and jars and jars of it. Yep. If you're growing vegetables, you need to be juicing. Uh, there's a guy out of um, Cypress, Texas. He just bought a juice company. He does a lot of vegetables, you know, high volume. He sells to Houston restaurants, vegetable production. He got out of livestock, transitioned to vegetables because he didn't want to deal with the feed bags. He didn't want to deal with livestock hauling and pigs getting out, chickens dying in the rain. <laughs> so he transitioned over and he has a green thumb, so it's easy for him. But he had a lot of waste. So this year he bought a, ju a juicing company and he's going to be using his vegetables and turning it into juice. I mean, you could, there's juice companies, fresh squeezed juice in Dallas that, you know, they'll juice your, your pineapples, your watermelons right there in front of you. One of my really, really good friends, she'll buy those teeny little hand-sized watermelons, cut it open, juice it right in front of you, and sell it to you for $15. And sells out has a line. And these people, I'm telling you in Dallas, these people have clickers like you're at a restaurant and you get buzzed to come get your order. It's ridiculous. But, and here, and some of you, like Michael was saying, now, I, I'm pretty driven. So I told my husband, I'm like, I, I'm driving from Adair to Dallas. Dallas is my hometown. Um, but that's a four and a half hour drive. I stay with family and things like that. <clears throat> but 
I told my husband, I was like, hey, this is going to be every single weekend for a year because I got to figure out the, the shopping trends for every season. So what I would suggest for y'all here, like in the southern region, oh, Dallas Farmer's Market wants y'all. <laughs> they want me to bring your products. They're like, we'll give you space. That's too much for me to deal with. But when your market closes, think about it. Think about applying to Dallas and bringing your harvest to Dallas. Because so many of us, you know, work on these April to October markets and we're trying to make a living. And there's six months out of the year where there's no open venue here in Oklahoma. So you can apply to the Dallas Farmers Market. It's $15 a day. It's eight to five on Saturday, eight to five on Sunday. You get a farmer first priority, so you'll be at the very front and everyone else will fill in behind you, but they want your products. So in the off season here, you can extend your market growing season by applying to Dallas. Come out, set up next to me and make hot dogs. <laughs> bring your veggies and make juice but they want you I, I'm telling you <laughs> if you want to get into Dallas let me know um, I'm very highly visible on online on uh, Facebook and Instagram and I can help you navigate that process but I do have a commercial kitchen in Tulsa that I'm connected with so I do have to have that maintain that you also have to have um, insurance so I have that, that's a farmer's market policy. It's $350 a year for a couple million dollars, but that's a requirement in Dallas. Um, but to extend your growing season, I'm telling you, y'all need to come down and join me because there's just not enough farmers to, to serve everybody. Anybody else have a question? Yeah. Campbell Risk Management. Campbell Risk Management for insurance. And you can fill out the little form on your phone and pay for it on your phone. And within 30 seconds, you'll have your insurance document emailed to you. Yeah, product liability. Yeah, so there, when you log on, it'll say vendor or market manager. So they can get it also for the whole market, but you'll do the vendor one, and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. We don't. I mean, we do private events on farm. We don't carry any additional on farm insurance, but we do carry product liability for you know getting anyone sick. Yeah. I wouldn't have carried it. I didn't carry it when I worked at the restaurant since everything was USDA inspected and just delivered. I wasn't going through this temperature change where I'm heating something up, you know, holding things, you know, things like that. So since that's a little trickier, it's always, and they require it, so it's always safe to keep. Yes, ma'am. No, they're very, very farmer friendly. And I also found it in the Farm Builder Entrepreneur Facebook group. Um, I've had, this is my second year to carry it. So I haven't had any problems, but it's there in case I need it. But they work with any farmer. You just, I think there is a thing on there where it says, you know, what your, in, your salary is, your income. But I think that I just populated that and Campbell risk. And that, that might be, um, I too sell over, I'm in the six figure range, so I don't know if, if, if it was something smaller if it was cheaper. Anybody else? 
Y'all want to go sell hot dogs? I love telling people I sell hot dogs. I'm telling you. I love it. I, it sounds so funny. And whenever I need to buy something, I'm like, you know how many hot dogs that's going to cost me? Like, I have to sell 100 hot dogs for that? Everything I do is how many hot dogs I sell. <laughs> like, that costs 150 hot dogs. That's my, my unit of measure. <laughs> And that's exactly what my friends laugh at me. What? Mm hmm. I got to sell seven hot dogs every round bell. I got to get my neighbor to go put out there. But I am taking a few months off. I'm taking, I'll go back in like April. I'm, I've been off for a couple months. Um, <clears throat> but the, if you go to Dallas, 60 and up is going to be a market a good market day. Dallas doesn't really know how to do cold weather. Um, <clears throat> well, I mean, 50 degrees, we'll think it's great out here, but um, 60 and up, and then, of course, they have their rainy season, so April, if it's going to rain, don't go down. It's just not worth your time. But we do have a permanent structure, so you're in the shade, you're comfortable, you have farmer first priority parking, so you have a assigned spot. They really roll out the red carpet. The team there is incredible. They built um, when they when it um, was private, you know, when it was bought out from the city. They built lofts on either side, so they've created a farmers market district, and then they also rent it out and have huge festivals and things like that to private parties. Like we have like taco throwdown and they'll get all these like taco trucks and come in and you can buy a ticket. And then they have the farmer's market at the same time. So they're bringing in thousands of people. And Mexicans don't buy bratwurst, I learned that. I'm Mexican, <laughs> I can't sell bratwurst on taco throwdown day. <laughs> but they have Oktoberfest. So with the festivals, if you do the festivals here in your local market, um, we had watermelon festivals. So our farmer's market encourages all the vendors to do something related to that festival. So when we do the watermelon festival in August, we have like 10 different varieties of watermelons. And we have watermelon games, like seed spitting contests, and all kinds of different watermelon games. Like the girls, the, the planning team really gets into it. but. Um, and then they asked the vendors to do something watermelon related. So I got watermelon cider beer and soaked my brats. So then they gave me a sign. It says watermelon cider soaked brats. People really get into that. And then Oktoberfest, we had a big um, festival for pumpkins. We had all these varieties of pumpkins and all that. I did Oktoberfest soaked beer brats. So you can, you can, you know, just make it a party. They encourage us to, I mean, I'll find a beer for <laughs> whatever we're doing. There's got to be a beer out there to soak the brats in just to have fun. And the community really gets into that. Um, but encourage your farmer's markets to, to have fun, I'm telling you. Follow the Dallas Farmers Market page for inspiration. They usually put a lot of events out ahead of time, and um, you can implement those here in your town. If you're not that creative, just start taking notes on, on what's coming up there and, and make it happen.